Thank you, Manny. Thank you all for getting up and coming out at this early hour to join us. Um, today, I'm going to walk you through just a few aspects of, uh, of dual energy slash spectral CT. I'll start a little bit with what the limitations are of signal energy, I'll talk a little bit about the dual energy implementations, and then I'll del delve into the, um, our implementation, which we call spectral CT because of it being detector-based and talk a little bit about the benefits that um, spectral CT can bring to you. So what is the limitation of single energy CT? The primary information that we get from CT today is a Hungsfield unit. And that Hungsfield unit is representative of the attenuation of material or tissue. Um, it doesn't tell me anything about what that tissue is. So you can have two completely different materials. An example here, I'm showing um, calcium and iodine. And I'm also showing you can measure identical or near to identical Hungsville units in the calcium inserts or the iodine inserts in this phantom. Um, and that doesn't necessarily tell me what I couldn't identify which was calcium, which was iodine. And that is largely what we see in a clinical scenario, especially in vascular studies. You might have an iodine the bolus containing iodine and um, calcification in the vessels. Additionally, we have issues such as beam hardening, um, which is uh, something that naturally happens with your uh, polychromatic spectra, and that's um, also something that you would run into with um, single energy CT. It turns out with single energy CT, there are two dominant ways that x-rays are attenuated. It's um, either a photoelectric effect or a Compton effect. And depending on what your material is, one, it may be more dominant as a photoelectric or more dominant as a Compton scatter or a mix of both. And it also turns out if we know what the ratio of photoelectric to Compton scatter is, we also know enough to make some classification of that material or some determination of that material. So ideally, if we can get to the point where we're able to tease apart the attenuation into these two separate uh, phenomena, then we are far away in um, deciding what the uh, material is. And it also turns out the way that you could do this is by getting the two measurements at two different X-ray energies. So that brings us to the first, um, the earlier implementations we saw um, in dual energy. So each of these are trying to acquire two samples of the anatomy. So we start with the first one where we use two X-ray tubes. So there are two tubes and two detector arrays, and they go around the patient, and every part of the patient needs to be sampled twice, once with uh, one tube at going at a high energy, and then once with a low tube going at the low energy. Um, so two tubes, two, two X-rays, um, there are, the challenges with this type of approach is, um, at least in the practical implementation we see today, and I'll see if my, I don't think my um, pointer works, is um, there's a, one of the detector arrays is smaller, so there's a limitation on the field of view, um, and there are issues with cross-scatter that needs to be, uh, I'm missing, I'm missing my target, so, so that's my. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the big one probably is that um, all, of the, uh, all of the analysis is done in the image domain. That's because there is no ray tr tr going from a source to a detector that is, that there's no path that is covered by both r sources and detectors. So basically you have to work in uh, image space. And there have been studies that, sh that have shown that um, there are benefits to doing your decomposition and, and dual energy processing in projection space because things like beam hardening can be addressed more effectively if you do it in projection sp space versus image space. Um, the second approach I show here is a split beam. And, that, and the way that this is um, doing it is that there is a filtration at the source that uh, basically splits the beam into two halves along the axis of the patient. You have the first half um, going at the lower energy um, because you might have a, a softer filtration and the, and the second half at a higher energy because you have a harder filtration which basically filters out 
the software beam. And for you to do dual energy by this method, you would need to run at a low pit so that each half of that beam can sample the um, patient. Um, so basically, you can look at it as being half the pitch or half the collimation. And um, of course, your, your true power has to be tuned to the higher energies where you're filtering most of the uh, photons out. And again, this is limited to um, image domain analysis. Third approach is the KV switching where as, we, uh, as you go around the patient, they are, the tube voltage switches rapidly from high to low. So it's a single tube, single detector array, um, but the benefit here is that you can do a projection space um, decomposition with this method, but, but after you use a little bit of interpolation. Um, the limitations that you see with this approach is that uh, dose modulation and dose tools are typically not available because you're switching the voltage and it's very difficult to switch voltage and current at the same time. And typically you need to slow down to some extent to allow yourself enough times to complete all of the switches per rotation. So basically um, you're sacrificing here again speed for dual energy. So each, each of these approaches, um, you need to give up something. The first thing you're giving up is your um, conventional imaging. And the second thing you're gonna give up is speed. Because as you go, if you want dual energy, then you need to slow down or do something a little bit different to get that dual energy. Um, the barriers to adoption that we've seen in dual energy to this point are the ones I've listed here. Um, perhaps the biggest one is workflow. It makes it a lot dif more difficult and a lot more um, interactive for uh, not only the tech, but for the um, radiologists when they're um, deciding should we do dual energy and once we do it, how do we look at the images? A second concern has been largely dose, because now we, um, it's been a concern over time. You, you're sampling the patient twice at two different energies. Um, how is this uh, affecting dose? And again, as I mentioned, in some of the approaches, we, can't, we lose our ability to use those tools. And then the last one is image quality. Um, what we've seen, and if you look in literature, is you'll see that image quality is good in certain areas in, um, in dual energy. And for example, at lower mono E's, it is uh, typically um, fairly challenging because you deal with a lot of noise. Which brings us to the um, approach that Philips, is Philips uses. This is the um, approach that we're using and the icon. And the way we go about this is we, um, we use a detector that is uh, layered. And the top layer here is going to collect your low energy data. And the lower layer is going to collect your high energy data. So the way that um, I was having a discussion yesterday, and the, um, the way that this person um, articulated it to me was uh, very uh, nice. He says, you can look at dual energy as if though you're taking a photograph and you're putting colored filters on your uh, light source as you take the photographs. And you can look at this as taking the photograph with a full spectrum of light, but then putting the filters on the picture after you've taken it. So effectively, that's what we're doing. We're going to separate after detection or through the, during detection the um, energies of the, um, of the photons into the two layers. And then the benefit you have from that is because you've got the same number of photons you would have detected with a conventional detector. So you actually have your conventional image available all of the time. So you have the low energy and high energy that you're going to use in your further processing. And then you also, you're not giving up your um, conventional image. So what are some of the uh, benefits we see? Well, there's no spectral scan mode necessary. You're always going to do spectral. If you're doing 120 kVp or higher, you always have spectral. It's going to be there whether you want it or not, and if you ever need it, you can go get it. Um, there is no protocol differences. If you have another scanner of ours, you can port that protocol right over to um, the icon, and that's what you're going to use. It's uh, basically dose neutral compared to every other scanner we have, including our premium scanners. Um, you can scan all patients. We have this installed at um, pediatric sites, and Dr. Dan Rad is going to show you some bariatric cases. And in, the workflow is integrated. So you can build spectral images, or we call them results, into your uh, exam cards. You can choose just to do the spectral reconstruction, and then later on, at your packs, look at it in our uh, thin client solution, or with uh, something we call the magic glass, and you'll also see that. Uh, we believe having spectral always on is actually beneficial. And there are a couple of studies I'm going to show you that basically um, supports this. 
Um, in this study, they, they basically um, looked at patients coming in and said, well, would we want spectral or dual energy for this patient? And then the answer, of course, would be yes or no. And then after the study, they would look at the patients again and say, well, do we wish we had it? And again, the answer would be yes or no. So in this instance, in this study, if you said yes and there was an added value, then that's great. Or if you said no and there was no added value, then that's also fine. You've made the right decision. The ones that, are, that is not quite optimal is where you would have said yes and maybe um, you've given up something. At the very least, as I said, your conventional image, um, maybe your dose tools, um, and then there was no value. So you've done this and there's nothing there for you. Or you said no, and that's the, that's the worst case, and that's the one that's highlighted is um, you said no, and then it turns out that you would have had it. So now, for some reason, you don't have all the information you need. Maybe you need to rescan this patient. Uh, here's another study that was fairly similar, but um, it went a bit further in depth. And um, basically, uh, same question. Patients come in. Would we like to um, do dual energy on this patient? And then after the scan, the que same question, well, do you wish you had it? And that's not a typo. In the prospective selection, about 20 percent, 23 patients in this study were, se were selected for prospective. When after the scan, looking at the, the actual scan and then retrospectively reviewing the data, it was a complete flip. So you could see the numbers are basically mirror images of each other. 80 percent of the time, they said, well, we wish we had it. And then further, they basically give a, a, a clinical significance score on this. and it showed that in 60, greater than 64 percent of the time, there was a rating of a clinical significance of two, three, or four, where basically four was um, highly relevant and basically um, could change the patient management. So with a spectral CT, you basically are going to get your conventional, so you, you see on the one side I have a conventional CT with a spectral CT, you can always have that conventional image, and you can think of um, as an addition, that you're getting for free within the workflow is your monochromatic imaging, lesion, which lets you do things like leisure characterization. Um, you have material decomposition and uh, material specific images. In terms of image quality, this is um, typically what we see in dual energy. If you look at your monochromatic images, they are made by a linear combination of uh, your basis materials. And I won't go too much into your uh, basis, but basically there's a process called decomposition in dual energy. And when you, after your decomposition, you recompose them in some fashion to make your mono ease. And what happens is when you recompose by using equal amounts of your basis, and in this case I'm showing photoelectric and scatter, which happens at about 70 keV, you have the best image quality. And the reason for that is you have something called anti-correlated noise, which means they're, um, it is the inverse of one is the inverse of the other, and they cancel out. So you have the best image quality at 70 keV. When you go down to 40 keV, you actually are using more of one of your bases and less of the other, and you actually amplify that anti-correlated noise. So this is why, if you look in literature, you're going to see at 40 keVs, the um, image quality tends to be poor at low mono ease. Um, and similarly, at high mono ease, the reverse happens. You amplify the anti-correlated noise the other way. What you're going to see, and I'm going to ask, and I'm going to uh, remind you to look at um, Dr. Dan Rad's images when he shows low KV images, especially on the icon. This doesn't happen. This is because we have perfectly uh, registered uh, data, spatially and temporally during acquisition. We can take care of anti-correlated noise as part of the reconstruction process, and you can see the noise across energies is pretty much flat on the icon scanner. So this is an instance where you would, I would say, let's look at the final image quality and look at the performance of the entire imaging chain of the scanner versus one component of it. We would say, okay, this component is better, but we say, let's look at the entire imaging chain. Let's look at the eventual image quality. That's what's important. And again, um, look at uh, Dr. Dan Rad's slides and his images as he show you mono E images. Um, what can um, I can't do for you in an economic sense. So here's one example of a study we've done. Um, about 14% of the uh, general population suffers from chronic kidney disease and cannot tolerate contrast. So what do we do with these patients? We either go with a very low dose of contrast or no contrast. And basically we're compromising the care when that happens. 
Um, how can um, ICON help in this case? Well, in this case, you can um, go to lower doses of contrast. You can go to those low mono E images, boost that little bit of contrast, and improve your image quality. Uh, what this study showed, there was a 34% reduction in time to diagnosis. There was a 25% reduction in follow-up scans because they were able to make a confident diagnosis on those patients with the lower contrast and using the capabilities of spectral. And there, there's about uh, $453 per scan of financial savings, which, of course, if you can look at your, your institution, the size, the number of patients you do, and you can scale that appropriately.